Monolatry Greek, monos, monos. Topic. Single, and Latreia, Latreia. Worship is belief in the existence of many gods but with the consistent worship of only one deity. The term, monolatry, was perhaps first used by Julius Wellhausen. Monolatry is distinguished from monotheism, which asserts the existence of only one god, and henotheism, a religious system in which the believer worships one god without denying that others may worship different gods with equal validity. Atenism The pharaoh Akhenaten, who was initially enthroned as Amenhotep IV, initially introduced Atenism in year 5 of his reign BCE during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. He raised Aden, once a relatively obscure solar deity representing the disk of the sun, to the status of supreme deity in ancient Egyptian religion. Year 5 marked the beginning of his construction of a new capital, Akhetaten, horizon of the Aden, at the site known today as Amarna. Amenhotep IV officially changed his name to Akhenaten, agreeable to the Aden, as evidence of his new worship. In addition to constructing a new capital in honor of Aden, Akhenaten also oversaw the construction of some of the most massive temple complexes of ancient Egypt, including one at Karnak and one at Thebes close to the old temple of Amun. In his ninth year of rule 1344-1342 BCE, Akhenaten declared a more radical version of his new religion, declaring Aten not merely the supreme god of the Egyptian pantheon but the only god of Egypt, with himself as the sole intermediary between the Aten and the Egyptian people. Key features of Atenism included a ban on idols and other images of the Aten, with the exception of a rayed solar disk in which the rays commonly depicted ending in hands appear to represent the unseen spirit of Aten. Aten was addressed by Akhenaten in prayers, such as the great hymn to the Aten. The details of Atenist theology are still unclear. The exclusion of all but one god and the prohibition of idols was a radical departure from Egyptian tradition, but most scholars see Akhenaten as a practitioner of monolatry rather than monotheism, as he did not actively deny the existence of other gods, he simply refrained from worshipping any but Aten. It is known that Atenism did not solely attribute divinity to the Aten. Akhenaten continued the imperial cult, proclaiming himself the son of Aten and encouraging the people to worship him. The people were to worship Akhenaten, only Akhenaten and the pharaoh's wife Nefertiti could worship Aten directly. Under Akhenaten's successors, Egypt reverted to its traditional religion, and Akhenaten himself came to be reviled as a heretic. In ancient Israel Some historians have argued that ancient Israel originally practiced a form of monolatry or henotheism. Both Frank Eakin Jr. and John Scullion believe Moses was a monolatrist rather than a monotheist, and John Day suggests that angels are what became of the other gods once monotheism took over Israel. John Mackenzie has stated, "...in the ancient Near East the existence of divine beings was universally accepted without questions." The question was not whether there is only one Elohim, but whether there is any Elohim like Yahweh." Some scholars claim the Torah Pentateuch shows evidence of monolatry in some passages. The argument is normally based on references to other gods, such as the "...gods of the Egyptians," in the Book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. The Egyptians are also attributed powers that suggest the existence of their gods. In Exodus chapter 7 verses 11 to 13, after Aaron transforms his staff into a snake, Pharaoh's sorcerers do likewise. In the ancient Near East, magic was generally believed to exist, though the Israelites viewed magic as being malign in origin and were forbidden from it. With regard to miracle and prophecy, the Bible commands the Israelites not to follow false prophets, those who compromise the law, and not to refrain from putting them to death. The miracles of false prophets are, like those of the Egyptian sorcerers, regarded by the Israelites as a divine test to see if the Israelites love the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their soul. The Ten Commandments have been interpreted by some as evidence that the Israelites originally practiced monolatry. Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 reads, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Hebrew, El Yalk Lim Rim Li and they argue that the addition of before me, at the end of the commandment indicates that not only other gods may exist but that they may be respected and worshipped so long as less than Yahweh. 
There is evidence that the Israelite people as a whole did not strictly adhere to monotheism before the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE. Much of this evidence comes from the Bible itself, which records that many Israelites chose to worship foreign gods and idols rather than Yahweh. During the 8th century BCE, the monotheistic worship of Yahweh in Israel was in competition with many other cults, described by the Yahwist faction collectively as Baals. The oldest books of the Hebrew Bible reflect this competition, as in the books of Hosea and Nahum, whose authors lament the apostasy of the people of Israel and threaten them with the wrath of God if they do not give up their polytheistic cults. On the other hand, medieval scholars often interpreted ancient texts to argue that the ancient Israelites were monotheistic. The Shema Yisrael is often cited as proof that the Israelites practiced monotheism. It was recognized by Rashi in his 11th century commentary to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 that the declaration of the Shema accepts belief in one God as being only a part of Jewish faith at the time of Moses but would eventually be accepted by all humanity. A similar statement occurs in Maimonides' 13 principles of faith's second principle. God, the cause of all, is one. This does not mean one as in one of a pair, nor one like a species which encompasses many individuals, nor one as in an object that is made up of many elements, nor as a single simple object that is infinitely divisible. Rather, God is a unity unlike any other possible unity. This is referred to in the Torah Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, Hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. In Christianity. Paul the Apostle, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, writes that, "...we know that an idol is nothing," and "...that there is none other God but one." 1 Corinthians 8 verses 4-6. He argues in verse 5 that, "...for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, but to us there is but one God." Paul distinguishes between gods that have no authority or have a lesser authority, "...as there be gods many, and lords many." and the one God who has universal authority, one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, of whom are all things. Some translators of verse 5, put the words, gods, and lords, in quotes to indicate that they are gods or lords only so called. In his second epistle to the Corinthians, Paul refers to the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4, which the 18th century theologian John Gill interpreted as a reference to Satan or the material things put before God, such as money, rather than acknowledging any separate deity from God. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints LDS Church teaches that God the Father, Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost are three distinct beings belonging to one Godhead. All three are united in their thoughts, actions, and purpose, with each having a fullness of knowledge, truth, and power. Latter-day Saints further believe that prayer should be directed to only God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Jeffrey R. Holland has stated, We believe these three divine persons constituting a single Godhead are united in purpose, in manner, in testimony, in mission. We believe them to be filled with the same godly sense of mercy and love, justice and grace, patience, forgiveness, and redemption. I think it is accurate to say we believe they are one in every significant and eternal aspect imaginable except believing them to be three persons combined in one substance. Latter day saints interpret Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, verse 11 Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, as we are, to refer to the characteristics, attributes, and purpose that the Son shares with the Father in the hope that people can someday share in those as well. In Mormonism, being one with God means gaining immortality, perfection, eternal life, and the highest level in his kingdom. As D. Todd Christofferson states, We may become one with God. As Jesus did, Joseph Smith taught that humans can become joint heirs with Christ and thereby inherit from God all that Christ inherits if they are proven worthy by following the laws and ordinances of the gospel. This process of exaltation means that humans can literally become gods through the atonement, thus, God, is a term for an inheritor of the highest kingdom of God. That allows for the existence of many gods in the future, but only one as ruler over life in this universe. 
To the extent that monolatry is not considered monotheism, the classification of Mormonism as monolatrous is strongly disputed among Latter-day Saints. Bruce R. McConkie stated that if monotheism is properly interpreted to mean that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, each of whom is a separate and distinct godly personage, are one God, meaning one Godhead, then true saints are monotheists. Topic references Topic Further reading Robert Needham Cust 1895. Essay on the Common Features Which Appear in All Forms of Religious Belief. Luzik & Co. Robert Wright, journalist, The Evolution of God, 2009, especially pages 132 at SEQ discussing conflict between Elijah and Jezebel. Mike Schroeder, author of 85 Pages in the Bible, Lumina Press, 2005. Topic. External links. Moses and monotheism. The Biblical Idea of Idolatry by José Fauer, differentiating the monolatry authorized by the Bible from the idolatry, iconolatry which is proscribed therein.